Hello, my name is Pastor Steve Estep, and whether you're watching one of these sermons from somewhere in another part of the world, like one of our deployed soldiers, you're a regular at Grace who just happened to miss last week, or you're just kind of checking us out, I hope you find the words of the sermon that you'll listen to today to be very helpful in your walk with God. May God bless you. Thanks again for visiting our site. Well, the formative kind of central story in the life of the people we know as Israel, in the Old Testament, that story was a story of the Exodus. You are familiar with it, right? People of God living in bondage to the Egyptians. And uh, this, I love this story because it, it gives both the, uh, the tough and the tender side of God. It shows his mercy and his might. It shows the compassion of a God who, who knows how to hear from people who, who are crying out to him in their distress. But it also shows, shows the strength of a God who's able to do something about it when he steps on the scene. So he works through his leader, Moses, and Moses goes to the Pharaoh, and he's kind of hard-headed, so it takes a series of ten plagues before Pharaoh finally says, all right, y'all can go. And God miraculously delivers his people out of bondage. I know a God who's continuing to do that even today. That no matter what form the bondage may take, no matter what the chains of addiction or, or whatever it is that may look like, there is nothing power, no power out there that's greater than the ability of our God to set people free from whatever it is that has them bound. So the people get freed from their, their bondage in, in Egypt and they spend the next 40 years wandering in the desert. And while they are in the desert, some pretty interesting things happen. And I'm reminded today that Deserts are a good place for interesting things to happen. There are things that God does in a desert time that he doesn't do when we're, you know, soaking up the sun and living in an oasis. So while they're in the desert, God provides some things for them. They get thirsty and God provides water. How does he do that? Water from a rock. They get hungry. God provides something for them to eat. What was it? Manna. Manna fallen from the sky. And they had manna for breakfast and manna for lunch and manna for dinner. These were a people who, for whom the distance between gratitude and griping was pretty short. Because one day they're like, oh, thank you, God. We were starving after that. Thank you for this manna. We get a few days removed from that. When they fix manna every way there is to fix it, I mean, they've gathered it and ground it and roasted it and basted it and boiled it and barbecued it and put it into cakes. But it's all the same. When it's all said and done, it's manna. And they're getting sick and tired of it. Reminds me of a trip I took to Mexico one time on a work and witness trip. Second time I was ever in Mexico. We had black beans with every meal. Black beans for breakfast, black beans for lunch, black beans for supper. By the time we were at the end of that trip, I'm utilizing visualization methods. And I'm not real big on all that stuff, but in order to get it down, I was speaking uh, to what was not as though it was. <laughs> you are chocolate pudding. You are chocolate pudding. You are chocolate pudding. That's the only way I could get that stuff down. So I can relate a little bit to the Israelites because they've gone day after day, man, at breakfast, lunch, and dinner. So they line up to voice their complaints to their leader, Moses. You guys have said... You've seen those folks around town holding signs. They get paid to stand out there on the highway and make people look at them. You know, like, like we buy gold stuff. I saw a guy this week. He had on a, uh, it was a shiny gold entire suit. Is he hold, holding up a we buy gold? I'm like giving him the thumbs up and honking the horn. He's waving. Um, I can just picture Moses with this like placard that's been hung around his neck that says complaint department. And everybody and their brother in Israel who, who's got a gripe against him or against God feels like it's their duty to let him know about it. So they're lined up day after day, voicing, nothing encourages a leader like a line of complaints. But there's Moses. It kind of, I think he probably felt a little bit like that guy at the Dollar General that I saw a few days ago. One day on my way home, I stopped at the Dollar General at... Um, Trenton Road and Wilma Rudolph. And I think everybody in St. Bethlehem had to pick up one item in Dollar General at the same time that I was in there. So they've got only one register open, right? Isn't that how it always happens? They got one register open and the line is going almost all the way to the back of the store. And the guy that's at that one register has this look on his face as you're looking around there like, I gotta have some help. 
I think that that was the sentiment that Moses had as the line of complainers grows ever longer. And uh, you, you know that it's not a really good idea to take somebody who's in a bad mood already and then make them wait a long time to tell about what they're mad about. So he's under some pressure here. But the same God who heard the cries of the Israelite people in their misery heard the cries of Moses in his misery. And I want you to know this morning that if you find yourself in a desert place, a place you don't want to be, a place where it seems like the only thing you're hearing is negative, complaint, whatever, God will hear from you. You can bring it to him and he will not be too busy. I love that song. He's a God who never slumbers and never sleeps. He will not be too busy to hear from you. So Moses cries out to him, what am I going to do with these people? And God says, all right, I got a plan, Moses. The weight of this burden is too great for you to bear by yourself. I get that. So what I want you to do is call the 70 elders. These were not necessarily all, you know, high and mighty spiritual leaders. These were, but these were like magistrate leaders of the community. I want you to call all 70 of them to the tent of meeting. Now, just a word about the tent of meeting. I don't know if that's what it looked like or not, but that's what came up on a Google search. The tent of meeting was the portable, kind of mobile sanctuary that uh, the Israelite people took with them all the 40 years they were wandering in the desert. It symbolized the presence of God. It contained the Ark of the Covenant. And every time they had to pack up camp and move somewhere, the tent of meeting would be carried by the priest out in front of the rest of the congregation or the people of Israel. And that was to symbolize that wherever they went, God was leading the way. Isn't that a great image? I'm glad that I, I know that I know today. Anywhere I walk, no matter where I go, uh, when I leave this, this uh, building today, wherever I go and wherever you go, God's already way ahead of you. He's already been there. So it would symbolize the presence of God. They get there, set the place up, and everybody knew that if God's going to do something big time, like amazing, over-the-top good in our presence, it's going to happen at the tent of meeting. So he says to Moses, get the 70 elders, tell them to gather at the tent. And when they get there, I, God, am, I'm going to do something that I've never done before. I'm going to take the spirit that is on you, Moses, and in you, and I'm going to splash it onto everybody else. And they are going to receive the same spirit that you have. Now, the spirit is going to be given to them, not so that they can say, Woo, look at me, I'm spirit-filled. The spirit was going to be given so that they would be empowered to serve. I'm going to put the spirit on them so that they can shoulder up next to you, Moses, and bear the burden so that you don't have to bear it by yourself. Now, I would be the first one to say that amazing things happen when people get filled with the spirit of God. We are empowered to do things we never dreamed we could do. We're given boldness to witness. We're given an authority over sin and over evil. We're given this uh, ability to be victorious, not in our own strength, but because what's coming out of us is the spirit who's within us. Great things happen when we are filled up with the spirit of Jesus, when, when we can say like John the Baptist said, I must become less and he must become more. As that happens in us, it can only be good. Amen. But... The Spirit is never given just for the benefit of me, myself, and I. It says in 1 Corinthians 12 that to each one, the gift of the Spirit is, a manifestation of the gift of the Spirit is given for the good of not one, but for the good of all. Amen. So when God puts His Spirit within you, good for you, but good for everybody else that's around you too. Because it's meant to impact and influence all of that. So God gives the Spirit, He said, you, you get them there, and I'm going to pour out my Spirit upon them. So sure enough, they got there and God made good on his promise. He always does. He always has and he always will. If he said it, you can take it to the bank. It's going to happen. So they gather there. God makes good on his promise. These guys get filled with the Spirit. They begin to prophesy. I'm going to come back to that word in just a minute. Only while they're prophesying here at the tent of meeting, there's this, uh, the camp, we'll make the camp back here. The camp's back here where all the rest of the people are. And there's two there was actually only 68 at the tent because two of them didn't make it. Their names were Eldad and Medad. Great names, huh? They, they for whatever reason, weren't at the tent. Did they, uh, were they busy doing something else? Maybe. Were they ceremonially unclean and, and didn't think they were allowed to be there? That's a possibility. I'm thinking it's probably the same then as it is now, that there's two guys that got left behind saying, what? I didn't, nobody told me. I didn't know we were having that event. I put it in the bulletin on the website. I didn't know. 
So while they're prophesying over there at the tent of meeting, these two guys get this same spirit on them. And they begin to prophesy in the camp. Now, I'm going to talk to you about that word prophesy. It does not mean telling the future. That's not what it is. The word in Hebrew is naval. And what it means literally is to pour out, to flow out, or to gush out of. And so we get this image of the Holy Spirit coming on them and into them. And the result of that is their words are, are directed and driven by the Spirit. So that when they speak, everybody in the house knows this is not from them. This is a word from God. Amen. What we believe is that after Pentecost happened, when, when Joel chapter 2 was fulfilled, I'll pour out my Spirit on all people, men and women, young and old, slave or free, Jew or Gentile, folks who were in our tent and folks who were outside of it, that that was, that was the intention and the desire that God has for all of us. Being filled with the Spirit so that we prophesy, we speak the words of God, is not just reserved for professional pastors. It is for the people of God. So that when you're in your home and you're speaking, it's evident that it's not just you, it's the spirit that is flowing into you that's coming out of you. It makes a difference in your marriage. It makes a difference with your kids. It makes a difference in the workplace. When we live out, we flow out of this life of spirit-filled living. That's what prophesy is. It's, it's pouring out what God has poured in. And it finds all different kinds of expressions. In this particular case, it was, it was with words. So these guys are prophesying at the tent. These guys are prophesying at the camp. And this is where the trouble comes in. Because the guy, I love Nate's red suit. Isn't that awesome? You got the whole red suit going on. Looking good, brother. These guys are over here seeing, they actually get word. There's a messenger that comes and tells Moses, hey, old dad and me dad are prophesying back at the camp. You know what the response at the tent was? What are they doing over there? They're not with us. They're, out, what, they're outside of our tent. God can't work that way. These are the lines that he's drawn. He works in this place, not in that place. It's not the only time that the people of God have struggled with celebrating the movement of the Spirit in places outside our own tent. In Mark chapter 9, there's this, it's only like two verses long. There are three, 38, 39, 40, Mark 9, where John, the disciple that Jesus loves, he comes to Jesus and says, hey, there's a guy out there that's casting out demons in your name. He's not one of us. So I shut that right down. In other words, he's not in our tent. He's not among us. I mean, God can't be operating outside the lines we draw. That is just not supposed to work that way. Here's what I believe about this. It's just like a universal truth about the human condition. Left to our own devices, we will be only concerned and consumed with what happens in our own tent in our own life, in our own family, in our own church, in our own nation. Let me give you some, a couple examples of this. I'm going to get just a tad bit political on you, but say you love me anyway, all right? And you love me anyway, right? Okay. Monday night, I went to the county commission. They had a meeting with a public hearing in preparation for their meeting tomorrow night where uh, they will likely approve this upcoming budget. There are a lot of people there. In fact, they, they had to move it from the normal place where they have this uh, public hearing meeting to the third floor, this humongous room. There were people on this. I walked in, could not get a seat. Had to sit in the nosebleed section up in the back. I didn't even know they had a balcony up there. So I'm up in the balcony, and it's time for the people that have signed their name on the list to be able to give voice to, uh, they can say basically anything they want to. So they step up, and here's, anybody ever been to a county commission or city? We ought to all, you ought to show up there every once in a while just to keep your finger on the pulse of what's happening in our community. So they have to stand up there. They state their name and their address because everyone wants to know they're not, you know, some outsider coming in. To, that, that's the first order of business. After they get done with that, the timer starts.